All right, so today we're gonna go over seven new releases that came out in May that caught my eye, that I saw some buzz around, and I have collected a lot of the buzz. If you're new to these videos, I watch a lot of YouTube, I watch a lot of booktube specifically, and I go through and I watch a lot of reviews. I link all those reviews down below. I have a Goodreads playlist if you care about synopses, because that's not really the focus here. I'm gonna focus more on what were elements of these books that people highlighted in a good or bad way to help you figure out, should I, you know, go check out this reviewer, should I go check out this book? etc. I've been doing this for a year and a half now, so I'll have that playlist down below if you like this style and you want to see more for different months. So without further ado, let's get into it, starting with probably the biggest hyped book. I don't know if by the numbers it has the most. I, I never look at the numbers till I'm editing the video so you can see how many ratings there are for the book, but I don't have an idea. And this is Yellow Face by Arf Kuang. This is the fifth published book. We have the Poppy War Trilogy, Babel, and then this one. This one I kind of knew going into the reviews, especially because I've read the other four books by this author. This is not going to be for me, um, especially because I assumed, and I think based off reviews rightly, that the writing style that she was going to use was going to be very similar to what she's used before, and it's not necessarily my favorite approach, especially for a literary satire suspense, which is what this genre seems to be. And first of all, it's just not even my favorite subgenre of reading, but when I do, there is um, a style to the prose that I like that I don't necessarily think Arf Kuang for me and my style would work. But that said, we've got a lot of fascinating reviews from two stars to five stars, and um, probably my favorite was with Sydney, who's, you know, a huge booktuber. I'm sure you already follow her. She's not even just a booktuber anymore, right? C commentates on a lot of media, but had a 30-minute discussion on this book and the things that they liked and didn't like and that was really fascinating to me, especially, and it brought home to me, like, yeah, the thematic play of this book would probably not have landed as well for me. Um, it was also similar for Bethany at Beautifully Bookish Bethany, who has also read, I think, every other Arv Kwong book as well. And in general, if you came to this for thematic stuff, it's going to be hit or miss. This is a hit or miss thematic book for readers, because some of the people who really like the stories liked the on the nose nature, liked the level of approach that was taken. And then the people who didn't thought it was a little maybe too surface level or maybe a little too tied to our time right now. Like it's like if you are chronically on the bookish internet right now, you're going to see all the references. But is that going to extrapolate well for five or 10 years from now? And for some readers that mattered and for some readers that didn't. And I did notice a trend. So um, Christie's Cozy Corner liked this, The Poptimist, Books and Bow, It's Monty Price, um, Overly Average Ben all really liked this. Rachel gave it four stars. Jess Owens gave it four stars. And like I said, um, uh, Bethany and with Sydney gave it like lower ratings. So that's like our range and all those videos will be down before. And I did notice this trend that when people liked this book, they really loved the mess of the main character. Um, and I think that can be something that's pretty fun is like if you're just watching a car crash, sometimes that is just engaging and captivating. And you aren't you know, noticing maybe some of the other things that would maybe sometimes bother you, maybe it never would. Um, for me, I haven't really been latching on to Arf Kwong characters, which is why I don't think that this would be a selling point for me to suddenly pick it up. But it does seem like this is kind of one of those spiraling out of control nature books, which can be wonderful page turners. I think The Poptimist, who is a reviewer I highly recommend, I really like his stuff, kind of described this as like a commercial airport read, but it has a little bit more to it than that. And I think that's generally what this book's doing. It's going to be very accessible to a wide range of people because her, her writing style, the way she plots, the way she crafts characters and themes is generally very accessible, which is a good thing. I think accessible art is always good, <laughs> but that does mean it's going to have mi certain mileage will vary for different readers. Um, a lot of people did like the ending and then some people really didn't like the ending. So that's also going to... <laughs> very depending on who you are as a reader. Um, basically, what I gathered from all these reviews is that I don't think this would work as well for me. Um, another review, though, I would point out if you are still on the fence is Books and Bow. Read The Poppy War, only liked it. Read this and loved it. So maybe if you align with their taste or, you know, you like what they like in satire, maybe this is a good read alike for you if you, um, follow that review. If not, Books and Bow. Fantastic channel. Highly recommend. And tends to read more literary suspenseful satire at times as well. So like, more has their finger on the pulse there. The next one is one that doesn't have that many reviews, but I was very interested in, and that's The Blighted Star. Um, I've been reading the Protectorate series, which is the first trilogy by this author, and this is a new trilogy. And I was really excited because a bunch of people who were reading Velocity Weapon and Chaos Vector started reading this book, and were like, oh my god, this is also so good. And this is kind of like a mid-weight space sci-fi series that really works for me, The Protectorate, so I'm assuming this would be 
very similar. And that's generally what I got. So the reviews I have here is Tori and Tori Morrow, although it's not really a review, it's an initial impressions. Um, Shell Space and Rachel from Shades of Orange. And I think Shell Space review is the most in-depth, so if you want like more talking time about it. Um, and then Rachel from Shades of Orange has it in one of their wrap-up videos. And in general, um, what I got is that potentially if you don't want the focus to be on interpersonal relationships that may or may not lead to romance, this might be a turnoff for you because it seems to have some strong romance elements. I kind of like that in my adventure story. So like, I, that's not a turnoff for me. So I'm pretty excited about it. And I mean, I have been really enjoying the banter and interplay between characters in the Protectorate series. So the fact that that translates over seems really fun. The world seems cool. I get the impression that this is a world where corporations are kind of the governments. So you can still have kind of sort of a monarchy class, but it's through corporations and wealth like that. So we have a main character from the privileged class. And I think our other characters like the bodyguard. So I don't think it's a bodyguard romance or anything like that, but I think it can have some of those elements. And there seems to be some really fun tech to play around with, which I'm not surprised about having read the Protectorate series. And so yeah, I'm expecting it to be a fun time. And that seems to be what I've gotten from their views. It's probably not going to be the most grounded science fiction. It's probably not going to be the darkest or the deepest, but I think it's going to be a really fun page turner time. And Rachel also points this out. And this is something I said about the Protectorate series is that Megan O'Keefe seems to be writing really fun, accessible science fiction. Like if you haven't been reading science fiction, if you're scared of it, you're scared of the jargon, but you kind of want to dip your toes in, I think this author is great for it. I also think it's still fun for seasoned science fiction readers. It just depends on what you want from the genre at this point in your reading. Like I've read hundreds of science fiction books by now, but I'm still having fun with this because even though a lot of the tropes and ideas are tried and true, there's still fun stuff to play around with. And I do think the adventures and the characters, for me, it's like the plot driven time that I really enjoy. And it's really hard to sell me on a more largely plot driven scenario. And I think part of that is the interpersonal relationships that I've seen in the Protected series. And the fact that there's gonna be one focused on in this series only puts it higher up on my TBR. Next up, we have a fantasy book by Martha Wells, Witch King. This has <laughs> been getting nothing but middling reviews, really. I, I think I have one person who really liked it. So if you want a very, oh no, no, maybe two people. Yeah, I had two people who had like very positive reviews. Whimsy Dearest and Sarah Evermotion's books. Both of them really liked this book. And then for the most part, Rachel Shades of Orange, Daniel Green, Mara Books Like Whoa, Bethany, and Frasier, they all kind of, you know, loved the beginning, loved the concept, but the actual follow through, the actual where the story went didn't really land for them, mostly because character connection was an issue. Um, so that it, kind of seems to be a thing. And for someone who is known for a character that everyone loves in the Murderbot series, this is a little odd to me. And I think part of it might be that there weren't interpersonal relationships being focused on. I have no real sense of it. Something that had like perked me up and like making me think maybe I should try it is it's kind of has a convoluted <laughs> narrative framework, which always makes me kind of interested. But the fact that it has that and Bethany at Beautifully Bush Bookish Bethany and I usually have a similar, um, taste in that sort of thing, or at least a similar patience <laughs> for convoluted styles. I'm, I'm a little nervous and probably won't pick it up. I'm more likely to pick up some of her backlist fantasy because I've heard really good things about that. Like when you look at Bethany's wrap up that I'll have linked down below, you're going to see Martha Wells at the beginning and the end because she does it from lowest rated to highest rated in her monthly wrap up. So yeah. And let's see, is there anything else that I forgot to mention? Oh, it does have a dual timeline, which is part of the convoluted nature. And also, although people really liked the ideas and thought it would be this unique time, it felt very traditional and very safe to a large number of the reviewers that I looked at. But it does have like something interesting about necromancy and life force and immortality. But as Bethany said, I think in her review, it's like, if you're going to have an immortal character, you have to make me care about them. And this lack of caring for our main character was something that kept coming up in a lot of other people's reviews. And then Frasier pointed out that this is kind of like a fetch quest fantasy, which like for me is like a complete like, oh, if I was interested, I am out now because I am not, not into that. But I think that does lead into why like Sarah was saying for her, it was perfection because this does have a lot of the traditional fantasy tropes, such as the questing nature and things like that, that she really likes with enough additional spins that I think it really worked for her. So, you know, when you're loving a lot of other stuff, I think then you also are naturally just like loving the characters and things like that. So if you do like traditional fantasy, I wouldn't turn you away from this. I just think maybe it felt like it was going to be more unique for people who like the more unique modern fantasy. And maybe that was the wrong place to market this book towards. Speaking of another more like adventure fantasy time, we have the Maleficent, Malevolent, yes, the Malevolent Seven, <laughs> which is, I think, you know, based off the trope of like, we have a lot of these types of stories with the X7 and it's a group of people coming together to do a thing. And they usually aren't like the best of people. Um, in this case, they are all mercenary mages. 
and this group's coming together. I don't remember what they're doing, but I have reviews from Alan at the Library of Alexandria, which should not surprise anyone because this is one of his favorite authors. Beckel Books, who gave it a three and a half star, so it's one of our more like middle of the road reviews. Uh, we have Middle of Nowhere, and we have The Nerdy Narrative. And both Middle of Nowhere and The Nerdy Narrative, this was their first book by this author, and they both had a really good time with it. And so um, I think if you have liked the authorial voice of this author in the past, you're going to be getting that here. Now, what I will say is even though you're going to have that similar authorial voice, Speckle Books, who really liked, I think it's the Trader Blade series or something, the first, you know, adult series that everyone always talks about, they didn't have the same character connection here and it had enough, like, flaws that, they, like I said, they gave it a three and a half star instead of a five star, which is what she gave the Great Coat series. That's what it's called, the Great Coat series. Now, this was not an issue for Alan, who has read that series and gave this a five star. And in general, though, something I should point out is no one really knows. Is this a start of the series? Is it a standalone? I think it reads as a standalone with openings for other books, but there are currently no publisher plans in the works, which was a bummer, I think, for the people who really did like it because they want more. Um, I, the people who really did like this did connect to the characters, which makes sense for this type of story. You're bringing a group of people together if the whole point is the dynamics of these people. And like, yes, they're trying to accomplish something, but like, you're there for the banter, you're there for the interpersonal relationships. And that has to land, I think, for the story to shine. And it seems like that's what it did do for Leslie at the Nerdy Narrative. This is also going to have that, like, narrative voice that has this fourth wall breaking quality. So if you don't like that, well, that's a feature, not a bug in this one. And Alan also compared it to how it is when you're collecting characters on, like, a JRPG story, where you're going to have more of an idea of who the characters are at the beginning of the story than who you pick up later on as we're going around for the quest. So for me, I don't know if I'm going to pick this up. I've been on the fence about this author for a while just because none of the premises have really spoken to me and having already read Amina al Sarafi this year which was another get the group together to go do a thing and that one was fun for me but not like as fun as I wanted it to be because it, these types of things I love in a movie because in a movie you can do the cool montage scene with the music and it's really fun and in a book you don't have the music in the montage scene <laughs> so I, I think for me this might not be my type of thing but it does feel like if this is your type of thing it's a very good form of it it's a page turner it has enough unique world building things to make you like oh how is this magic working with the wizards but it's also comfortable and accessible it's not like so new that if this is one of your first fantasy books it, you can't like dive right in and see what's going on Next one I have is a contemporary young adult. This is the Warrior Girl on Earth, I think. I only wrote Warrior Girl in my no notes, but I know it has another word for it, but you have the title here. And this is the author of Firekeeper's Daughter. And I have reviews from Bethany, Michelle Thor Wants Another Letter, Books and Other Nerd Things, and Audrey at Perpetual Pages. And this is kind of, like I said, young adult contemporary with thriller mystery elements, I think is kind of the genre blend we're going to have here. And basically all the reviews I have really enjoyed this work. I think the lowest rating was a four and a half star. And the intentionality in the author's note um, even raised the rating for book and other nerd things because it was thematically focusing how indigenous bodies from the past and present are abused and seen as disposable. Um, so it does that through having a lot of different threads in the story and how it weaves it together. And one of these threads happens to be this suspenseful heist scenario as they're trying to get an indigenous... Um, artifact. I don't know if that's the right word, but there's something that is not in the hands of the indigenous community that is in the hands of a different museum. And our characters decide the only way we can do this and fix this is to do a heist situation. And that's where I think a lot of the tension of the book is, but there's also a lot of dark tension in the realities of these missing indigenous women. So it seems like this is just as strong as Firekeeper's Daughter. I know some people like Firekeeper's Daughter a bit more, but if you liked that work, I think this is still going to be a really strong companion sequel. I know it takes place 10 years after that first book. And I think it's different characters, but it may be a, the same community. And yeah, I, like I said, glowing reviews. It seems like the highs were high, the lows were lows. It's that blending of emotional experiences you want from this type of work. And I, I do need to read from this author. I do think young adult contemporary actually works for me a lot more than speculative young adult. I just never prioritize it. But I do think next time that I do, it's going to be one of these two books. Next up, we have The Enchanted Hacienda, which I only have two video reviews for. One is um, a library, a Camel Clay public library, and then one is Laura from A Book Circus. And then I did glance through a lot of the Goodreads reviews just to get a general tone for it. This seems to be a like 50-50 romance fantasy book that has people were comparing it to Emily Henry meets like Practical Magic meets Encanto, like all of that kind of put together. And so I guess no going in and we're, we're doing a lot of 
quarter life crisis coming of age scenarios that's also tied with a romantic element and her family happens to be magical but she's the only non-magical one um, and some of the story takes place i believe in mexico on their ranch the hacienda and so that's all of the general tidbits that I know. I do know that when it worked for people, they really liked the romantic element. They really liked exploring the themes of this and were connected to the main character. But when it didn't work for people, they were not connected to the characters and they didn't care and they found it boring. So those are the worst reviews I found. It's just like lack of connection. It wasn't engaging. It was kind of boring. But when people liked it, it's because they connected to the characters. So this is like a very subjective ground. So I think if any of these are your like buzzwords for like a cozy adjacent type of fantasy read, because I'm not sure if I would say it's cozy. Some people were comparing it to the secret society of irregular witches, potentially, but maybe not, like, as much of a favorite. So if, like, something in that vein, this might be worth trying out to see if the writing and the character work, like, connects with you. Um, yeah, I, I was hoping for maybe stronger reviews from Laura, just because Laura and I have very similar tastes. So when she loves a book, I'm like, I gotta put it higher in my radar. Like, we don't always align, but, like, we do a lot of the time. So that's, you know, it was just kind of one of those things. And then the last book we're going to talk about, I have a whole page of notes on because it's like the book for this month. And that is The Will of the Many. I think it's this and um, Yellow Face that were like the big books of this month. And this book, I don't know how many ratings there are, but the ra average rating is very high. It's like fourth wing level of high. So this is like I mean, they're both adult fantasy books, but this is a very different adult fantasy, but they're both school magic. So I think adults right now are really nostalgic for magic school settings because those are the two biggest fantasy books of the year right now. And so this one is Roman setting, um, school, like I said, magic school setting, kind of a hard magic system. Maybe it's not super hard, but the magic is used like a science and it is a magic where the people I think are the resources so we're gonna have a lot of conversation about that and our main character was compared to Quoth and Darrow from Red well Quoth from Name of the Ring and Darrow from Red Rising a lot except I think maybe he's more violent <laughs> which you know you know Darrow that's you know something and it's first person present tense which is very relatable to the Red Rising series um I was People were comparing it to Red Rising, but say it's kind of only an aesthetic comparison. They're still, like, very different projects. And the reviews I have are Petrick, Nico's Book Review, Phantology Podcast, um, Bookishly Bookish, Rachel from Shades of Orange, and Murphy. And so there's a, there's a whole range here. I think that, like, in general, the first four I mentioned, like, four and a half to five stars, really loved this. Um, all of them had a great time. And then Rachel from Shades of Orange, more like a four star. And Murphy... They, she doesn't really do star reviews, but it felt like a very, like, it's a good book and it's better than Lycanius for her. Like, she only read the first book, but she doesn't love it as much as everyone else. So that's, like, the range of reviews. And so all of these people, though, said it's stronger than the Lycanius trilogy, even the people who loved the Lycanius trilogy. They thought that there was such a step up in writing style and character work. Like, for once, like, when people talk about the Lycanius trilogy, n I never know any of the characters' names because no one brings them up. Here, people were talking about Vis a lot. <laughs> So it does seem like he's an important part of the story. He is one of the reasons people are enjoying it. Also, there was a lot of mention about the friend dynamics in the school, which I really like hearing that. Like that was from um, Bookishly Bookish, who's a newish channel. Um, highly recommend checking her, checking her out. I really liked the way she approached the video. Like even though it was a really long review video, I was engaged the entire time, which with my intention span, that's, that's not normal. And she was the one who mentioned the friendship dynamics, which like has me really interested that was like a thing I really liked in fourth wing and a thing I like in school settings it's like I like when people make friends like yes there can be an adversary and whatever and there can be tension and stakes whatever but I want people to have connections make friends <laughs> that's the thing I want to like latch onto in these types of stories and I think for the most part everyone really thought the ending was ramped up to like a hundred and maybe that the first 30 percent was slow ish but it really varied like no one was consistently saying anything about pace except for the ending so for some people, this was a page turner the entire time. And for other people, it was kind of slow paced the entire time. So I don't really know what that means <laughs> or how to interpret that. Um, I think it's definitely more plot driven though than it is character driven, kind of thrown back to the Lycanius trilogy. This seems to be an author who more plots things out. And something that was brought up that has me intrigued and equally nervous is that one of the plot motivators is this underlying mystery that you know is there, but you don't know why it's there and how to unpack it. And like, why is this person at the school? There's more than one reason. And the way information is doled out and how new questions are answered seems like it's very well balanced. So I am more intrigued to pick this one up by this author than I am the Lycanius trilogy. I have not been interested in the shadows of what was lost. Um, I even know 
because I've watched so many reviews on it at this point, kind of sort of the twist that everyone kind of tries to keep hidden. Um, but this one, I think, is maybe a little more up my alley. I probably will wait to read it till after I'm done reading Red Rising, because <laughs> I've been reading first person present tense for a while now, and I don't know if I can do too, too much of that at once. But when I'm feeling a magic school setting and want like a page turner, I think I might try this out, because I think for me, this might be a page turner fantasy. It is a big book, though. I was looking at the people who had the physical copies. It's a it's thick, <laughs> which isn't a bad thing, but in a world where I can only read so many tomes a year, gotta be a little selective. I might be curious to see what the audiobook is like for that, which I'm trying to remember if anyone actually mentioned the audiobook. I don't think I have anything like that here. But basically, if you like the tropes that are brought forth, I think you're gonna like this book. And even um, the Phantology podcast who doesn't like the magic school trope and the things that kind of come along with that baggage had a really fun time here and found that although it hits some familiar beats, it also was quite subversive and surprising in some of the routes that it took. So these are the seven books I chose to highlight this month. Let me know if there were other ones that you thought should be on my radar. What are some books that you are looking forward to hearing about in the June recent release roundup because I'm starting to collect videos for that. If you just want to leave an emoji to let me know you're here. Ooh, I don't know. We've, we have a lot of books here, huh? Why don't we... I'm just looking at all the names. We had wi wizards and witches, so something like that. Either one of those people, emoticons, or a wand. Anything that makes you think of that sort of stuff in the fantasy space. And otherwise, like if you liked it. Subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.